Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Harry Stobart, and I'm going to talk to you today about pricing crypto interest rate swaps. So without further ado, let's dive right in and ask ourselves, well, what is an interest rate swap? It's an over-the-counter agreement to exchange a series of fixed rate cash flows for a series of floating rate cash flows tied to a benchmark. Now, there are a number of technicalities with this project, with this product, the first of which being that at initiation, the contract is structured such that it has zero value. That means that, of course, there is no, um, no payments on by either party uh, at initiation. So, of course, well, we asked the question, well, what is the price then? What is the price of a swap? And as it turns out, it's the fixed rate of the swap. The swap fixed rate is what we will determine as the price. In addition, it's also worth noting that the floating rate payment is paid for at the end of the period, but known at the beginning of the period. And both of these facts will be quite important when we come on to the pricing equations. Now, there are a couple of other definitions I would like to cover before we move on, first of which being discount factors. Now, this is the present value of $1 received at some point in the future. We also have spot rates. These are the continuously compounded annual returns invested of $1 invested today until some point in the future. And we also have forward rates, which is the continuously compounded annual return of $1 invested between two future points. But of course, that rate is known today. And it's also worth noting that given knowledge of one of these, we can completely determine any of the others. So how do we go about pricing such a contract? Well, the fixed rate is, of course, known. So, it actually, so pricing the fixed leg simply boils down to discounting a series of cash flows. So let's introduce some notation. We have R subscript S as our fixed rate of the swap, the price of the swap. We have the time between interest rate payments that we'll denote as tau. And then it simply becomes a case of summing the discount factors. Nothing too complicated there. The floating rate leg is slightly more complicated, but we can look at things, but we just uh, recall, we just mentioned that it's paid for at the end of the period, but known at the beginning of the period. And that means that we can look at things from an equivalent perspective. Let's consider, well, we can look at things from an equivalent perspective because the benchmark itself is investable. So let's take our $1 and let's invest it in the benchmark after a time period tau, we'll be left with our initial $1 plus the return from the benchmark. Now let's remove that $1 from, uh, from the benchmark. And what we're left with is simply the return on the benchmark, which will cover exactly our floating rate payment, which means that we can look at things, well, we can look at that floating rate payments as an outflow of $1 and an inflow of $1 after one time period. But we know something about $1. We can represent them as discount factors. And so if we were to then repeat this across the life of the contract, we'd have a lot of cancelling each other out. It would, in fact, be a telescoping sum. And we'd simply be left with one minus the final discount factor. One, of course, being the discount factor associated with today, because after all, we're not discounting anything. Equating the two and doing a little bit of rearranging, we find that the price of the interest rate swap is simply the equation given on the screen. Now that represents a little bit of a misleading picture. You see, swaps are in fact so liquid that rather than using the discount factors to compute the swap fixed rate, the inverse is true. And we in fact use swap fixed rates in order to compute the discount factors and construct associated curves. Now, curve construction is not a straightforward technique. We have to first divide our curve into three separate sections, the short, the medium, and the long. And then we need to determine appropriate instruments that we would then include within those. Now, for the short section, we may use deposit rates, such as LIBOR. For the medium section, we may use forward rate agreements or euro dollar futures. And then for the long section, we may will typically use swaps. Now, for the first two, there are explicit formulas that link the observed market rates to the discount factor. So nothing particularly challenging there. However, for the long section, we need to use a technique called bootstrapping. And as you can see, the formula is given on the slide. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to use the observed market rates in addition to the discount factors that we've calculated so far up to a certain point. And then we're going to use all of that information to infer the discount factor associated with the next time period. Now, that all sounds great, but I present a problem. Unfortunately, 
not all maturities of swaps have liquid markets. Now, if we have a 10 year swap, that might be liquid, a 15 year swap may be liquid, but how do we bridge the gap between the two if we, may, if we need something like six monthly discount factors? And the answer is we interpolate. But in order to do so, we have to ask ourselves two questions. Firstly, what are we interpolating? Are we interpolating the discount factors themselves in what we've termed the explicit method? Or, uh, or are we going to use the fact that we can obtain any of the other rates given any of the others and interpolate the spot rates, convert those into discount factors, and then go from there in what we've determined at, or called the implicit method. And then, of course, we need to decide how are we going to interpolate? Are we going to use something like linear interpolation or cubic spline? So that's exactly what we've done on the screen. And you can see the three graphs. Let's focus on the top two to begin with, uh, our spot rate curves. And as you can see, the four different combinations give almost identical results. We have a little bit of a, a bumpiness towards the shorter end. And unfortunately, that is just simply a case of us gluing together the short, medium, and the long term sections. In practice, you might use a blended approach, in which case the time periods may overlap and you could produce a smoother curve, but we haven't done that this time. Um, unfortunately, the same cannot be said for our bottom curve, and that is the forward rate curve. And as you can see, it is highly unstable. If you were to present that to your boss on a rates desk, the chances are you'd be leaving at the end of the day with your things in a cardboard box. <laughs> But this does serve to illustrate a really quite interesting point, and that's the challenge of curve construction. The trade-off between the brute force, no arbitrage based on the inputs that you've used versus what you might expect a more traditional, smoother curve to look like. After all, this will price back to exactly market rates, the inputs, the financial instruments used as inputs. But if you look for something a bit more complicated, like an exotic, the chances are you're going to be losing a lot of money. Unfortunately, in the real world, you might use something like an optimization technique. Um, but as this project was not focused on curve construction, we elected to move thing, uh, to end things there. There are a number of practical considerations that we need to consider. Um, first of all, being day count convention. Throughout this project so far, we've assumed that tau, our time between interest rate payments, is constant. But the day count convention may not um, allow that. In addition, we've assumed that our fixed rate payments and our floating rate payments occur simultaneously. And again, as the table on the screen illustrates, that may not be the case. So these are certainly co added complications. At a slightly more macro level, everything that we've considered so far is a more traditional single curve framework. But since the financial crisis, things have moved towards a more multi-curve framework and the use of overnight index swaps in addition to LIBOR-based instruments in order to construct this curve. Now, we have the slightly more challenging problem, um, the slightly more recent problem, sorry, that since January the 1st of this year, LIBOR ceased to be an appropriate benchmark. And in fact, it was no longer um, being quoted as markets have moved towards alternative risk-free rates. Now, again, these are of course challenges that we need to consider. But let's move on and consider the crypto space. Now, we chose to look at one specific example, the Bitcoin US dollar funding rate swap. Um, in the world of crypto, we've moved away from interest rates and we're now considering the floating leg as the funding rate. Now, the funding rate comes about because of the perpetual nature of the underlying contract, which means that every eight hours, the contract can be seen as being rolled over and a payment or a fee must be made. Now, under normal circumstances, that's simply a payment from the long party to the short party, assuming, of course, you hold an open position over this time. Well, I say under normal circumstances because the opposite is also possible. Now, unfortunately, that funding rate is not an investable benchmark. So we can do no clever tricks in order to compute the present value of the floating leg, which therefore means that we need to do something a bit different. And as a result, we pay the entire fixed rate upfront in, an, in, excuse me, in an analogous fashion to a premium within option pricing. And in fact, it shares the same name. So how do we do that? Well, we've got our fixed rate, the fixed rate of a swap. We multiply it by our currency exchange rate. The fact that it's a reciprocal is merely a, um, a result of the fact that the underlying contract is itself an inverse contract. That's not particularly important at this point. And then we simply multiply that by our time to maturity, tau bar, this time in seconds, because we're working on a much smaller scale. And the large number on the bottom is simply the number of seconds within a year. Now, I would love to be able to stand up here and tell you that we've gone on further and constructed these crypto-based curves, but unfortunately I can't. 
it appears that this product, uh, this, uh, this product is no longer traded. Um, and there is a lack of available historical data for that time period, at least when it was traded. So that somewhat limited our analysis. However, that does not mean that there are not avenues for future work. At the smaller scale, if someone were able to get the or get a hold of that data, the historical data, then of course they could extend our analysis out and construct such curves. Alternatively, on a larger scale, there is a gap in the literature for a theory of cryptocurrency interest rates. And of course, there are other areas within the crypto markets that have variable rate payments and could in theory host interest rate swap like products. I've been Harry Stobart. Thank you very much for listening.